I'm going to rave some more men. We'll bottle them up here and then smoke them out. Welcome back to my dark corner of this sick world. Yes. A world of torture and terror. 1966's Cyborg 2087 is not an especially bad film, but it is worth looking at for reasons that will become apparent. Oh, marvellous! We open with a glimpse of the breathtaking technology of the year 2087. This is a time machine, sending the day the Earth stood still's Michael Rennie back to the year 1966, but clearly not everyone's happy about it. Five, four, three. What's going on? Find Professor Sigmund Mark. Bring the professor to this command. If he resists, destroy him. This Professor Marx works for Future Industries. Research today for a better tomorrow. I can't wait to see that. One of these in every household. Ironically, Rennie's Garth has timed his visit poorly because the professor has left to prepare for a demonstration he's giving tomorrow. Tomorrow at nine o'clock, the world is destined to learn of Professor Marx's important breakthrough in the field of radio telepathy. Garth apparently isn't worried about revealing that he's from the future to the professor's associate, Dr. Sharon Mason. You'd be terrified if you knew the importance of radio telepathy in the world a hundred years from today. Marx's experiment is the starting point of a blending of man and technology that will lead to all humans being controlled by chips in their head. Their thoughts are controlled by the state. Garth is here to stop that. You are an agent from the world of the future. But it's not easy. He has been followed by other agents. These agents are cyborgs programmed to find and kill. Time-travelling cyborgs sent back to stop Garth from changing the future. Half human, half machine. Programmed to kill. By this point, you probably have spotted what makes this film interesting. It's Terminator. Or, more accurately... As you can see, my transmitting equipment is built in. It's Terminator 2. You are a cyborg. Cyborgs like Garth are tools of the state, but... Some of us were captured by the leaders of the freedom movement. Something he proves to Sharon's friend, Dr. Carl Zeller. OK, so he doesn't cut the flesh from his arm, but the principle is the same. The only difference is that Garth has kept hold of his own clothes, and you never think about the importance of the first person a time traveller meets. I need your clothes, your boots, and actually forget it. Now the actual Terminators, or Tracers, arrive to hunt Garth down, every bit as threatening as a T-1000. Yeah, these guys jogging through the movie are an issue. Even as they demonstrate their superior strength, they also demonstrate their baffling inability to walk around a car. And they're not the only problem. Out of sight! Nothing makes the blood curdle like Hollywood's attempts to be groovy. This actually undermines the plot because all you're thinking is, yeah, installing a chip in these kids would be a massive improvement. Haven't you got anything better to do? Yeah, that's right. You know, jerk it. OK. The tracers are following a signal from Garth's chip, which has led them here. Problem being, he left already. Is there a delay on the chip? Do they have to go everywhere he went rather than just straight to where he is? Well, you certainly are in a mood. I am in a way because this ought to work. It's not about the budget, the absence of Arnold Schwarzenegger or even the clumsy action. It's just a bit off. Sharon is captured.
but the action-packed climax is just a long five minutes of cyborgs punching each other. I don't buy Sharon falling for Garth. Creating a love triangle with Carl. Damn it, I can't compete with a cyborg. I like the fact that Garth is willing to sacrifice Sharon for the sake of his mission. One life is a small sacrifice to make if it will free tomorrow's world of such monsters. I don't like the fact that he then gives in to his own humanity. Still, it manages a very strong ending when Sharon wants to go back with Garth. I will not exist in the world of the future. After nine o'clock, you will have no memory of me. And all the things that have happened since I arrived will not take place. And so... Carl, what time do you have? It's exactly nine o'clock. <sighs> That's a good ending. Unfortunately, it's not the ending. I must disappoint you. There'll be no demonstration today. We get a tedious seven-minute coda. I suddenly became aware that the improper application of such a system could result in a scientific and social disaster. Gripping. Now, I should say, this doesn't add up. Time travel pretty much never does. Marx alone retains memories of a man who will never exist and a future that will now never happen. But I don't think that would bother you if you didn't have to sit through him droning on about it. The consequences, far reaching, possibly far beyond our present understanding. Cyborg 2087 came out two years after Harlan Ellison's Soldier, the oft-cited inspiration for Terminator. But it's so close, you've got to wonder. It's not the best film, but it is an interesting one. Nothing ever happens around here. Just a quiet, peaceful little town. Thanks for watching. For more old-fashioned but interesting stories, check out my books. There's a link in the description below. What other classic sci-fis seem to prefigure films of the modern era? Let us know in the comments below. I must leave now. I know.